Um, yeah, it's a really a pleasure to be here in the East, and uh, it's been great to work with Rajiv over the, the last number of years. We've been uh, back and forth. We've been at many of the same events together, and uh, he does a great inspirational job and really paints the picture of both affordability for students and empowerment for faculty, and that's the critical equation that we think makes open work. eCampus Ontario has really been known for uh, funding for online course development over the past number of years, and we expect that will continue with the present government and even with new governments because Ontario is very committed to bringing courses to citizens and making them as easy to get a hold of as possible from all of our institutions. A survey that we did last year with Ipsos pointed out the huge opportunity for adult learners in continuing education and people coming back to education who may already have an undergraduate degree. And this is going to be a big area of focus, I expect, in the province over the next few years. And we hope to push the open movement into that area of thinking. So the continuing education question that came up in Rajiv's talk is a great place for that to go. Um, one of the things that I continue to say is that from this point on, onward, technology and learning are, will be forever intertwined. And so we're, there's no escape. Uh, we're going to have to be really good at the way we use technologies effectively in classrooms to build great pedagogy that is great for learners and want, compels them to come back for more over time and to keep going. This is a CC by NCSA license diagram from Paul Hibbets and Myra Traven. And it's been used in British Columbia for a number of years to describe the kind of interconnectedness amongst the design and development of learning and how you have to filter it against the technologies that are available in the day. And we know that new ones will be available all the time. One of the things we did at eCampus Ontario last year was to consider three themes for 2016-17, 2017-18, and to really think about where we would put our resources and our energy. And we put them in three areas, rethinking learning resources, and open is the big focus there, rethinking the learning experience, and our student experience design lab is the big item there. Uh, Chris Fernland from our team is here today, and he's at the back. He's a former USA. Uh, member, and so is very active with the student body. And one of the things that Chris and others brought to us was the notion that if students are the target for many of these technologies and learnings, maybe they need to have a say in how they're designed and how they're effectively deployed. And that's what our student experience design lab is all about. The third area of practice that we're looking at is recognition of learning, particularly the things that happen on a co-curricular basis, the kinds of things that students learn on practicums, internships, work integrated learning opportunities where they don't really get fully recognized often in a transcript and we need to think of other ways of recognizing that learning. So those are the areas we've been looking at. But I wanna talk primarily about rethinking learning resources today and just give you a sense of how we're approaching this in Ontario. It's really the question of what happens when you put things out into the open. What does that create? What kind of environment does it afford? What kinds of technological uh, perspectives do we have to bring to bear? Spark, uh, which is a library group of which many of our Canadian libraries in the higher education sector are members, have a really great definition of open education. And I think it's really important to note that it goes beyond textbooks into resources, tools, and practices. And for many of our faculty members, it's the ancillary resources, the slides, the homework, and the test banks that are really some of the high value ways that we can bring open to the teaching and learning environment. OpenStax has been a model of high quality, high precision, free and open textbooks for the masses. And these textbooks are the ones that have been the target for many of the sciences and uh, 
disciplines around the sciences, like mathematics, um, that want to really start to take a deep look at the opportunity afforded by free against a $300 resource. Anatomy and physiology is one of the most downloaded texts on the planet, simply because it crosses so many disciplines, from the health sciences to biology to, you know, a kinesiology, all kinds of areas are interested in anatomy and physiology. And having that book available for download or in PDF format in a very portable document format to use with an e-reader is really important. And it's all afforded by that change from all rights reserved to something that allows a simple, standardized way for people to grant permissions to you so that you don't have to ask, so that there's no mystery to it. You're not left with that nagging fear, am I violating someone's rights here? No, you're not. Some rights are reserved. The author fully owns the IP, can do whatever they want with it over time. But many institutions are starting to borrow that approach and take them into discipline areas way beyond the first year science, mathematics, history, and so forth, into things like the health professions, mental health, clinical teaching. And one, two of my colleagues put together while I was at BCIT three years ago, the British Columbia Institute of Technology, clinical procedures for safer patient care. One of the biggest issues in healthcare these days is the communication that happens between interprofessional care teams. And they put together a wonderful manual available in multiple formats that addresses just this issue. It has broad scope across many health professions, not just nursing. One of the first things we did at eCampus Ontario last October was to meet with student groups from the five student government groups in the province of Ontario. And we brought in student government advocates from British Columbia to speak with them and held a day of just kind of dialogue on the affordances of open and how this might work in Ontario. Julia was there, diagramming the day, as always. And lots of cool stuff came out of those discussions. All of the dynamics from affordability to simple, you know, getting better access to really the big questions for student government. Who do we lobby? What are the policy initiatives that have to change? What about tenure and promotion in the academy? How would that be affected by going open? And interestingly, and Rajiv, and I chatted about it in the break, the University of British Columbia has changed its tenure and promotion policy to accommodate OER production as part of a tenure portfolio for faculty members in the teaching track stream of tenure. This will happen in other locations too, but it's important to know that tenure now supports OER creation. And we left that meeting with students last October with a kind of a roadmap of the one, Highway 101 we wanted to follow to get open happening here in Ontario. And I can tell you, the efforts of USA and other groups in this province has been fundamental to our Ministry of Advanced Education, funding the Open Textbook Library in Ontario, funding the call for proposals last spring, and funding the open publishing infrastructure we're currently working on that I'll tell you a little bit more about. It all amounts to choices for students from the student perspective. And the student panel gave you all the great reasons why this is important. And just canning that or collecting that and making it available for others to hear would be extremely useful. But Ontario needs more to really support an open education approach across the province. We need storage and distribution. We need authoring systems. We need incentives for review, adoption, and adaptation. 
And of course, we need training and support. And there are a lot of different groups that could play a role in this. But primarily, we're looking at teaching and learning centers and libraries as the open, friendly environments for faculty to go to to get assistance with open pedagogical approaches, open publishing support. We already have some storage that we've created. And Rajiv pointed out that we now have an, a library that looks just like the British Columbia Library because it's primarily a clone of that library. Everything that appears in British Columbia appears in our library. Opportunities for you to find are rich. Opportunities for you to adopt are there. Opportunities for you to adapt are primarily tied to funding programs at this point because it does take effort and academic labor is real and we need to reward it and we need to incent it. And so we're trying very hard to come up with the funding mechanisms that would make this possible across Ontario. When the minister announced the Open Textbook Library last June, it was very well received by everyone who attended that event. And we've had lots and lots of people inquiring about open textbooks, have been looking into the library, been downloading samples to try them out. So we know there's some opportunity there, but we need to build a greater community on campuses to move it out further. Government's even been advertising lighter backpacks, heavier wallets. Like they get it and they're starting to get their marketing aligned to that way of thinking. So the big idea of open is really giving expanded power to these resources. And from our perspective, that means we have to give faculty expanded power to use them effectively and we need to support ways of building out more ancillary resources. And we need to find ways of working with people on campuses to do that in kind of culturally sensitive and contextually sensitive ways. Just having full legal control to use these resources means a whole list of possibilities arise for customization, for localization, for personalization, updates, translations, remixes. All of these are words that we typically don't use as much when we talk about learning resources of the publisher textbook type, and we now have all of these affordances available to us, so the opportunity is to actually act on that possibility. But we have to think beyond textbooks, and that's where you'll probably see our next calls for proposals from eCampus targeted a little more directly towards other kinds of resources and other ways of thinking about using open resources effectively. Assessments are really an interesting area, and Rajiv talked a little bit about peer assessment and the opportunity afforded by peer assessment technologies and the way in which faculty can use it with students to create items for formative assessments and to evaluate students on the quality of the assessments they build as opposed to the answers they give because of the deep knowledge required to build good assessment items. What we're really trying to do in Ontario, and we use the kind of Ontario campfire metaphor for this, is to build a kind of collaborative community in Ontario higher education and invite people to the table and invite people to that community. Because it's the connections that are important, not just within your campus, but across campuses. And we're already seeing some of these across campus connections starting to happen. And they happen often in the context of adopting and adapting a textbook where multiple authors from different faculties in different institutions 
could work together to bring their expertise to bear to provide a really custom collection of multiple viewpoints and entry points into subject areas. We have six ways to connect with what we're doing right now in open education. We've created from a group of engaged faculty who met last March in Toronto at OCAD University to hear Rajiv and Robin DeRosa speak, to hear David Wiley remotely talk about the origins of open and the power that it provides to good-looking people <laughs> who do good work. And what we've created is a set of open rangers, people who are located on campuses around the province, who are your go-to people for support within that environment of open production. And Julia is one of the open rangers on this campus. Do we have more? Uh, well, Matt, was. Matt was, but he's now at U of T. They're benefiting from that. OK. We need more open rangers. We've also created an open fellows program. And we advertised for open fellows um, a few months back. And we're able to find six faculty or librarian or instructional developers who are interested in moving open thinking ahead in the province of Ontario and at the same time doing some research associated with that. It comes with a very small stipend. The stipend is mainly to pay for travel and for people to present at conferences, but it's a starting point and we'd like to do more of that and we encourage you to look further about opportunities to become open fellows. One of the things that we're also starting to do is to work with open rangers to create three kinds of activities built around the notion of a sprint. Getting a group of like-minded people together for a day or two with an outcome in mind to build stuff that benefits others and that is openly licensed. So our colleagues at Guelph hosted one, when was that? A month ago? October. That's great, what a fantastic starting point. During the test conference last two weeks ago, uh, we did an open textbook sprint to customize a pre-Confederation history text that began its life in British Columbia but was becoming customized for Ontario. And one of the fantastic outcomes of that project was a template for a syllabus that is a one-pager that students can look at and fully understand everything that happens in that course. How much reading, how much writing, how much lecture, how much self-study, does it have an open textbook? Wonderful syllabus template that we're going to open source and make available to everyone. And the third area is test bank sprints. And this is one Rajiv organized in British Columbia a couple of years back, the Great Psychology Test Bank Sprint. Two days, 17 psych faculty, six institutions, 850 questions. It's not too onerous if we can pay for your travel, accommodate you, feed you, and bring you together to build something of collective good to use with your colleagues. We're hoping to do more of that in 2018. I'm just watching my time. The big message from all of this is don't reinvent. Adopt and adapt. We really need to get better at reusing things that already exist. The students talk about environmentally friendly. This is an environmentally friendly thinking, way of thinking about academic products. Peggy French, who's in the audience from Mohawk College, is looking after open textbook adoption announcements in the province. And we're trying to be very ongoing with our announcements in a way that they're visible to people so that you can see what's new in the library and who's adopting textbooks and get a sense of the building movement and growth that's happening in the province. 
Ontario Extend is a self-directed learning program that we built over the summer based on six modules called the Anatomy of 21st Century Educators. And it's the notion that everybody has some of these attributes in their toolbox as a personal faculty quality, but they may not know a lot about others, particularly on technologies that could be useful in the classroom right now. So we built six three-hour self-directed learning modules based on this schema produced by Simon Bates at the University of British Columbia. The relationship between teaching and scholarship, curation and collaboration, technology and experimentation. And we encourage you to take a look at these because they're not onerous to try out and they're actually a lot of fun. And Julia was one of our authors. Hopefully downstream, we'd like to badge them as well. So you have a, little, a few little badges to go with your awards. You're not only a ranger, you're a badged ranger. We're currently building activities to go with that set of self-directed learning models that will be openly licensed. And so we're looking for contributions to the Open Extend Activity Bank. And we'll be sending out URLs in our newsletters for people who would like to contribute to it. So it's just a very small contribution. Get your feet wet, dip your toes in the water. Another piece of the puzzle at eCampus Ontario is the notion that people would like to try out some new technologies, but often it's hard to get them mounted on campus. Big IT process. What we want to do is try to lower the risk and provide a sandbox environment for people to kick the tires on some new types of technologies that are coming to the forefront. Virtual reality labs, we'd love to see a bank of virtual reality sims that were openly licensed. We'd love to see that begin to evolve. A badging environment for people to use open badges in interesting ways to certify and authorize that students have skills and competencies beyond the domain knowledge they're here to use. That they're great team players, wonderful public speakers, great presenters, that sort of thing. And experiential learning, the kinds of tools you might use to self-direct a learning experience in the workforce beyond what happens in your university at the same time as you're conducting your studies. What would that look like? We're playing with those ideas. We have a great weekly newsletter called The Catch. And The Catch is kind of an update of all the cool stuff that's happening around Ontario in institutions. And this is your opportunity to self-promote the hell out of yourselves. Tell people what you're doing. And it got big over the last two weeks because of the TESS conference, which was huge. And so just reporting all the cool stuff that came out of TESS has taken two issues to get it right. So we would really invite you to stoke the fire at the catch at eCampusOntario.ca. And if you've got a really great story about a resource you used or a technique you tried or something that really came out of a peer-to-peer -peer interaction with colleagues, let us know about it. One of the other really nice pieces of work that was done at Fleming College last year is called the Open Faculty Patchbook, a community quilt of pedagogy. It was developed by Terry Green, who's one of our program managers. And the idea was to create a resource for new faculty incoming to the institution to give them some thoughts from colleagues, peers, who have been in the work for a longer period of time, who have things to offer that might be beneficial to them as new faculty coming into the workplace. We're wondering if there's an open learner patch book that could be assembled too, with the kinds of ideas that we came, that came out of our student panel today. Those kinds of ideas are really important to promote, to tell the stories through voices other than ours at eCampus Ontario. The world of open is fantastic. But as you know, in any paradise, there are sharks in those waters. And currently, the sharks in those waters 
are people who I've seen open as a revenue stream that they would like to pursue. I don't know how many vendors have knocked on our doors over the last two or three months with schemes that are simply there to monetize their product or service using open as the vehicle to do it. We're really not that interested in that approach. The open washing definition was a tweet from Audrey Waters, 2012. So the term has been around, like greenwashing, for quite some time. And it's that issue of using the appearance of open to substantiate a proprietary approach, where nothing really changes and the resources are already available to you for free. Gotta be cautious. Be open. These are slides I used at Waterloo as well, if you want the full deck. Be open is the message we'd like to convey. And talk to us if you have great ideas you'd like to be involved with in open education, open practice, open pedagogy, open anything that works in the context of your learning and teaching. Please let us help in any way you think would help you. Thank you. I'm on time too, Julia. You are so on time. So we have time for questions. When's the next call for proposals? Uh, that's usually, uh, I had about a dozen people ask me that, so I'll just be the proxy. When's the next call for proposals? So we're just going into the uh, next round of funding at eCampus Ontario, and typically the big problem has been that government works on fiscal years, so we end up going and getting our budget in April, and then they want us to offer a call in June, and then it won't be September before it's evaluated, and then they want you to do the work while you're in class, like you know September to January, January to April. We're trying to flip that paradigm around right now, and so our discussions with government currently are about what would be the focus they would like to fund, and when, could we, when is the soonest we could make some announcements. We would hope to announce as early as possible in 2018, but nothing's ever guaranteed when you deal with government. So we expect there will be another round of funding. We just don't know when. What I can tell you is that government is really interested in return on investment, to put it bluntly. And that is they're looking to see that we've thoughtfully considered through data what areas of practice in the undergraduate experience would be great territory to invest an open model at scale within. So you can imagine that they're looking at things like healthcare, business, and other topical schemes that might actually allow us to go deep and get to the Zed cred kind of initiative, but through a much broader experience than simply one or two small programs. So those are some of the considerations that are happening right now, and I don't know when the next call will be. What if, um, say perhaps, the VP of Finance just walked in the room right now, and you, uh, you know, had wanted to update him and tell him something about, you know, a lot of the things that I hear are things like, um, like who pays for open? If you have an open textbook and we have a campus store, you know, like how are we going to make up the revenue uh, for that? It could be lost in that way. We are trying to be competitive with other institutions in Ontario. If we're just sharing our resources, how do how do we make that viable? If we just give everything away, well, how do we differentiate ourselves in that framework? I mean, I'm on the board of trustees. I need to make be accountable. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think the differentiator has to do with the programs that you provide and the service to those programs and the students that you attract based on the reputation of those wonderful programs. And so the resources are just one part of it. And for many students, saw Rajiv's talk, that's the barrier. We want to kind of do away with that barrier and allow people to follow a passion, to personalize their learning, and to do something really purposeful with their lives. And we think that's the real mission of the university, is to facilitate that, not to operate necessarily as a profit center. Yes, but we, you know, we have shrinking budgets from the province. 
right? They, they, they lo it's 35% we've gotten uh, in, in this year compared to, you know, 1990 where they were giving us 70%. We, can we even call ourselves a public institution? Man, oh man. <laughs> Take it to the social activist, let him answer that one. These are the conversations that I have to have. Like, yeah. these are real conversations. And so I don't mean to grill you because I, you know, I adore this and I love the movement. And I know we have great teachers on campus who really do want to make a difference and that, that they want to do it first for students all the time. We have student first teachers right across the campus for sure. But these are, these are the, the fiscal realities, right? So how do you balance that? Yeah, I think, I think you have to go with the place where you can make the most impact the soonest. So I think it's... It's, it's no secret when we did the same thing in British Columbia, and I said this at Western a couple of weeks ago, I've now convinced two ministers to go in this direction in two different provinces. And in both cases, it came down to high enrollment courses in first and second year as the primary target, because that's where we would make the most difference for students. Thank you. That's, the, that's the story. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Nobody can follow my grilling. <laughs> no. Hi, David. Thanks for your talk. Um, so as a scholarly communication person, I spend a lot of time talking to faculty about open scholarship. And there's a lot of parallels in terms of um, the need to change culture and habits um, around things like attitudes towards the cost, even though um, the cost for the students for OER is free, faculty might lose revenues, there's the issues around prestige, there's a the big issue around convenience. They don't necessarily want to invest the time in finding or developing a textbook, so any tips you can share on changing culture would be really helpful. Well, I think it has to do with that collegiality piece of colleague networks. I think when we see people get together in these textbook sprints where uh, faculty with some like-minded, uh, faculty who are like-minded and have share a common interest in a discipline get together, they begin to share ideas more readily. And I think one of the things that has happened over the past number of years is that classrooms tend to be very individual. And there's not a lot of collegiality among the development groups on campus, right? It's really hard to get people to work together. It's a big time sink. Um, but I think making it convenient, that's why the sprint methodology brings people together for short periods of time in a convivial environment to have great conversations with their colleagues. What comes out is not always a finished or polished work, but it's a starting point, and that's critical. You want to say more? <laughs> Give it to Rajiv. I think he wants to say more about that. I think you're asking the right question. Um, so I think one of the things we've tried to do certainly is you will always have the innovative pedagogues who will innovate not just without support, but sometimes in the face of active opposition. Right? So, so recognizing, supporting, identifying those early adopters, supporting them, recognizing them, ensuring that there are other people who perhaps are inhibited because they think this kind of work wouldn't be supported, that, it, that perhaps it would be penalized allowing them to see that this is actually uh, something that's good and that the institution supports. Um, I think you're right, asking, uh, framing it the right way. For, so, for students, it is about cost savings. For faculty, it is about pedagogical innovation. Uh, and for administrators, it is about uh, persistence, completion, uh, the, the metrics that they follow. Uh, and there's a net tuition benefit to the institution. If you can align existing incentive structures uh, as well, whether it's tenure and promotion, whether it's uh, ed leaves and sabbaticals, uh, whether it's internal grants. Um, I think it's, I think just making sure that you're normalizing it uh, by, by, by allowing people to see that their colleagues are performing the work. But um, I think that, yeah, that you're never gonna get everybody, of course, uh, but you start with the early adopters and ultimately you wanna get to the point where for the majority of faculty who would do this, if it was easy and set up and if, they, uh, if the resources existed, that's fantastic. But I would love working with the innovative pedagogues who will work with their students to produce the resources that will be simply adopted without any more work by the majority of faculty in the middle. Thanks. 
Thanks, Rajiv. I should notice, I should say that this was, uh, we put this in as a, a, a retention grant opportunity because the, I do know that there is um, uh, data that shows that students will complete. So if you look at it, if it just takes a, a shift, a mind shift, Thanks. right? <laughs> so I know I'm setting you guys up for questions. Is there anybody else who wants to say, ask a question? I think we can get to the next phase. Thank you, David. Thank you. That was great.